So, hydrotherapy. What does that mean? Water. Hydro, water, hydro is water, therapy, therapy. So, we're using water in different ways, in different forms, whether that be ice, whether that be as a liquid, hot or cold, or as a vapor. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the vapor side. There are things that we can do with that. I just, I'm going to focus on ice. I'm going to focus on hot and cold water today. Okay, so I want to go over some basics when we're talking about hydrotherapy. What happens when we, when we cool or heat different areas of our body? So what happens locally is, let's start with cooling. When you cool, let's say, let's say I've got this bucket of cold water here, and I'm going to put my hand inside of there. Well, what's going to happen is I'm going to create vasoconstriction, meaning the blood vessels in my hand are going to contract. That's a reflex, okay? So that's going to slow down the circulation. It's going to slow down metabolic processes, and we're going to uh, let's see, what else are we going to do? We're going to decrease the, the migration of blood cells, white blood cells. So that can be good at times. It's also going to kill pain. It's an analgesic. So it's going to decrease the pain. And it, it tends to have a what's called a tonic effect. So it tends to give you energy. So have you ever heard of like you're, you're stressed out or you've been working all day and you're tired and you splash some cold water on your face? And it gives you dump a cold water bucket of water over your head. Has anybody said that? Have you ever tried doing that? That that does have a foundation. It it will give you this waking up sort of a tonic effect. It really does work. That's great. So, the Rush yeah. Fitness Pool. Right. Rush Fitness Pool. Holy mackerel! Right. Cold. Jump into a cold pool. That'll wake you up. All right. So let's go to the other side. If we're going locally heat, so if this was hot water, and I was put my hand inside, what happens is we're going to see the blood vessels will open, so we're going to get an increase in blood flow, we're going to get an increase in metabolism, so that's the, the, the normal processes of a cell are going to be increased. Um, we're going to get an uh, increase in leukocyte or white blood cells coming out of the blood vessels and going into the tissues. I've missed anything. We're going to get an increase in oxygenation. In fact, there have been studies where they took someone's forearm and they put it in hot water, and then they tested the blood supply going, coming in and out, and the venous blood supply, which is the blood coming back towards the heart, had the same oxygen content as the arterial blood supply. So it greatly increases oxygen. So that's, that's really an, a great tool for when we're trying to heal in areas, getting blood flow and oxygen there. So open up the blood vessels, get more oxygen, increase metabolism, increase the white blood cell count. It also has a, a pain-killing effect. It's an analgesic as well. And it's so, relaxing. So both cold and... Both of them, both cold and hot, will and hot. have their own way of decreasing pain. Mm -hmm. So... Um, now, having said that, that's a great segue because oftentimes I have patients and they come in and they're in pain and I ask them what they've been doing and they may be trying to do things naturally and staying away from medications and they'll say, well, I've been using a heat pad and I lay on a heat pad and that helps me to feel better for a while and then it stops helping. And I'm going to give you a general rule of thumb. When we're dealing with pain, anytime you have pain, there's inflammation there, okay? That's kind of a given. So inflammation has a few, few uh, factors. One is heat, another is swelling, um, and there, there are more involved there, but those two, heat and swelling, you're increasing by adding heat to an area. So heat can actually cause you to have more pain. If it's an acute injury, if we're talking about acute inflammation, meaning recent inflammation, and you add heat, it might feel good at first, it might feel relaxing, and it is bringing blood supply there, which is good, but then the blood supply stays open and stagnates. This, it slows down, and you're gonna have increase in your inflammation. So, when you have pain, 
In general, ice is the answer. Ice, when you use it for about, depending on the application, if we're talking about an ice pack, like you see over here frosting over, that, that ice pack takes about 15 minutes if you put it on the skin to, take, to make the skin numb. If you put your hand in ice water like this, it takes about five minutes to go numb after a lot of pain. That's right. Yeah. And then if you were to use an ice cube or something like that and, and do massage, it takes about three minutes for the skin to go numb. Now, that short application at first is going to vasoconstrict, create, uh, it's going to close off the blood supply. It's also going to take down swelling. It's also going to kill pain. But then you'll notice that the skin turns bright pink because the, there, it's called the hunter's reflex, where first it's cold and there's vasoconstriction, and then blood is drawn to the area to heat it up. So you get new, fresh, oxygenated blood. And that is excellent therapy for pain. So people who say, oh, I just, I just I can't handle the cold, you're doing the wrong thing if you do heat, if it's acute pain. You need to use ice, okay? Rule of thumb, pain, ice. Stiffness, tension, that's time for heat. And the other thing to that is inflammation, oh, I'm sorry. Let me read here. Infection, thank you. All right, infection. Infection does not like ice. You don't want to cool down an infection. Actually, infections need to have increased blood, white blood cells. And remember, that's what heat does. It increases the white blood cells. So that's going to help heal that infection better. So you need heat when we're dealing with infection. Um, by the way, I've made up some notes here, and they're going to be available on the website, healthbydesignor.com. So if you're watching this on video, you can go to my website and get this first, and then watch the rest of the video. Um, so what are the two reasons why you use heat? Heat for, for like stiffness. Say you can't stretch very well something, that, that's a good time to put heat on. That'll help soften up the tissues and you'll, you'll have better, um, you can stretch better. Kind of like the same theory about warming up your muscles before you exercise. Shoulder tension. Right. If you have tension and it's not painful, you can use heat. And then there becomes the, the great benefit of alternating hot and cold. You start with heat, then go cold, and then repeat, always finishing with cold. And that, that's just because, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, so we'll go, come back to that. On the notes here, there's a little illustration of different colors, and it's in English and Spanish there, for those of you who want to practice your Spanish. Um, there are different areas that will create a reaction with the organs that are underneath the skin. So let's say, for example, you want to affect your kidneys. With heat, it's going to increase blood supply, it's going to um, increase the white blood cell production, the, this stuff might be necessary if you're having a kidney infection, right? You want to bring the heat there. So you can put heat over the skin, over your kidneys, and you're actually going to increase the, the blood supply reflexively to those organs, all right? So that's awesome. Now the same thing is true with ice. If you were to take ice and put it over your heart, for example, if you're having a uh, rapid heartbeat, if you're having um, what's called tachycardia, you can put an ice pack over your chest, over your, um, I'm sorry, your heart, and that's gonna slow down your heart rate. And in fact, they use that before doing surgeries now for, for heart surgeries, sometimes. So, um, very powerful, and that's what this illustration talks about. Different areas that are gonna affect different organs within. That's a reflex. And if you're, typically, it's going to follow along with those rules where you know, cold will, de will vasoconstrict, heat will vasodilate. But there's an exception, and that exception is to the abdomen. Okay, so your intestines. If you want to increase your, your gut's motility, if you want to increase your um, acid production, you're going to use cold. Now, that seems kind of backwards. You would think that it would be the other way around, but you're going to put cold in your abdomen and that actually will increase your, your digestion and your acid secretion. However, if you're having acid, extra acid secretion and you don't want that and you're, you feel like your, if your bowels are moving too quickly, you can use heat over your intestines and that slows everything down and it decreases the acid production. So that's, that's a great home therapy. Heat like using this heating pad 
that simple thing you can find at any drugstore. You, haste, you could just use an ice pack like this one. Once again, you can find at drugstores. Um, usually it takes maybe about 15, 20 minutes. All right, so on the back of your notes, you're going to notice we're going to start with some common treatments. But before we get started here, what I'd like to do is we're going to do two demonstrations of some common ailments that, or common treatments for, for common ailments. Um, so I've got already two volunteers, and um, on this side we're going to do what's called a hot foot bath. And the hot foot bath consists of a bucket of hot water. Now this is a really good therapy, and I, I want everybody to learn that, that's why I'm demonstrating this one. Um, you just put your feet in hot water, and we take a washcloth, and we take ice water, we, we, we wring out the ice water out of the washcloth and we have a person laying down with their feet in the hot water and covered up. And the washcloth goes over the head. And what we're doing is we're taking away congestion from the head or from the lungs or from the pelvis and we're moving it towards the feet. Okay, so you got a congestive headache, feet in a hot bucket of water, and a cold compress over your forehead and you're going to get rid of that headache, potentially. If you're having congested lungs, like maybe you're, you're catching a cold and it's gone to the lungs. You can do this as well. It helps to stop a cold or greatly alleviate it. Um, you can also use this for, I talk about pelvic congestion. That's mostly like for females who are, let's say they're, they're getting close to their, their cycle, but it's like not coming on time and there's bloating and they're uncomfortable you can do a hot foot bath and that's gonna start the process. So, all right, so let's let's start with this demonstration. Um, Would you mind very much repeating the stomach when it was, when you put cold on it, that did what? When you put cold over your stomach, it's gonna increase gastric motility. So you're gonna, your, your digestion is gonna move faster and it's gonna increase your acid production inside of your stomach. So that's that's going. I think there may be one other. Why does that seem opposite? Because I know it is. That's why I said the heat would make. You're right. Speed up. We don't know exactly why it's opposite, but it is. Okay. So that's why I want you to know about it. Um, yeah, it will decrease blood flow. It increases blood flow when we're talking about the mm -hmm. ice, and so it's backwards. Mm -hmm. as, as to what you would think. So the heat to the abdomen is what. Heat to the abdomen will actually slow down your your digestive system. It's going to lessen the blood flow to your digestive system. It's going to decrease the acid production in your stomach. Okay, so can I please have my lovely volunteer just have a seat here and lay back comfortably. And before you don't put your feet in yet, it's a good idea to start with hot water but not so hot that it might burn you. If you got help, that's great, but I, since I'm here and I'm here to help, I'm gonna take my lovely assistant's feet here and we're going to put my hand in first so I know if it's too hot. And then, okay, good. We'll go ahead and let her feet rest inside of there. And this, the water should go up to about the ankles, okay? And then we're gonna take a blanket and you're gonna get warm. We're going to cover up the bucket itself and the patient's legs, and we could actually go and cover all the way so that you're comfortable. If you get too warm, you can you can toss that off. Okay. Don't fall asleep. Yeah. <laughs> you're allowed to fall asleep. <laughs> all right. And I've got this cold ice water, and I'm wringing out the towel, and I'm just going to. Lay that across her headache. forehead. Yes, by the way, this lovely patient has had a headache all day. So we're hoping to take congestion out of her head and bring it down towards the feet. Okay, now, the next example that we're going to do over here, we've got a hot pad. And I'm going to go ahead and turn this thing on. Now this is for lung congestion as well, for bronchitis, for pneumonia, Anything that need, requires more blood flow to the lungs, in this case, we've got uh, a lovely assistant who has suffered with asthma. So we're gonna try and increase the circulation to her lungs to try and strengthen the lungs, right? So 
please come on over. Would this be common, Dr. Renee, for uh, children when they have croup and they're coughing and things like yes. that? Yes. We, 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 I have two very young children, two and four, and we do this on them and they love it. So, all right, and they'll sleep typically through it too. I'm going to bring this up just a little bit more so that this is underneath your more of your lungs. There we go. Are you comfortable? Okay, good. I'm going to cover you up as well. Now we we've got heat on her back. I'm going to give you the clicker because I want you to be able to turn it off if it gets too hot. Okay. All right. Let me give that to you. Right now it's just got a rubber band so it stays on. You got the plant too. I got the plant too. All right. I don't know where they will like it. We've got an ice pack going on your chest. Okay, so what's happening here? We're kind of being confusing. We've got heat on the back, we've got ice on the chest, and the body's thinking, i got to heat up this area, i got to cool down this area, and the blood is just going to keep on circulating through the lungs. All right? So I'm going to put this right across your chest, and I don't want you to get chilled. So I'm going to get another blanket because I think that one might not be quite warm enough. Don't chill. With any of this hydrotherapy stuff, we don't want to bring down your body temperature. There are times for that, but typically no. Are you comfortable? Okay. How are you doing? How's the water? Nice. Okay, good. All right. So let's go on. What we're doing here, like I said, with, with the treatment with the hot foot bath, we're relieving congestive headaches, potentially. We're relieving congestion in the lungs, potentially in the pelvis. We're stop we can stop a nosebleed. Because what's happening with the nosebleed is you're getting too much blood coming out through the, the, the mucosa of the, the nose. And if you can take the blood away from there, then you're going to stop that. Um, we talked about how this can help prevent or alleviate the common cold. So you feel something coming on, you get a hot foot bath, and you may stop it cold. Okay, and That's wonderful, right? Who likes getting the cold? Yes. Do you recommend zinc? When people feel a cold coming on as well, in conjunction with that, or no? Zinc can help with the immune system. That's, an, that's a totally other, other topic. Yeah, sure. Zinc helps, echinacea, vitamin C, golden seal. There are lots of things that, no, that can help no, in natural. Don't take too much of zinc. No more than 100 milligrams. Yes. Is there a reason you lie flat, or can you sit you on You can the sit. Duty? You can? With this okay. one, you can sit. Okay. With this one, it's better to lie down and just relax. Okay. Um, so with a hot foot bath, you may have seen cartoons where there's a little old lady in a rocking chair with her hot foot, feet in a hot bath and got an ice pack on her head. I've seen that cartoon. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else has. I saw a got little a man. thermometer in her mouth. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because this, these, these techniques have been around for more than 100 years. And there was actually this doctor, his name was Dr. John Harvey Kellogg. He recognized the name because he invented cornflakes with his brother. Well, he also was just a incredible physician, incredible surgeon, and he found out about hydrotherapy, and he really, he, he kind of developed the technique. He's got these two enormous books that are very difficult to understand. They're chock full of information, but um, these are simple ones. There's all kinds, it was basically an, an entire system of medicine, just hydrotherapy. So there, there's a lot of benefit to this stuff kind of fell along the wayside when, when we got the uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So anyway, here we are you still comfortable here? I think I'm gonna change this. Flip it, make it cold again. Okay. Now over here we talked about this is gonna help keep the blood in the lungs. So if you're fighting something inside of your lungs then the blood is what brings your white blood cells, and that's what's going to heal. In all cases, blood coming to an area is what we want when we're looking for healing. That's your, your nutrition, that's your oxygen, that's your white blood cells, <coughs> that's what cleanses or, or takes out the toxins that are left behind whatever trauma is going on. Okay? Um, so now we're going to let these ladies just relax. Um, let me know if if you have any discomfort, either one of you, okay? Now, we talk about sitz baths. We talk about hot sitz baths to begin with. Now, what is a sitz bath? 
It's a bath where you sit inside of a bucket. There's sometimes they're, they're actually baths that are made for sits baths, and they don't have your legs inside the water. Basically, you, you sit in water, whether it be hot or cold, it goes up to your navel, and, or your belly button, and you are there for about, depending on what you're doing, two to 10 minutes, okay? With the hot sits baths, what's ha happening with that is we're increasing blood supply to the pelvic organs. So this helps with dysmenorrhea, which is painful menstrual cycles, all right? Um, it also helps with acute and chronic cystitis. Now cystitis is bladder infections, okay? So this is very helpful for bladder infections. It's very helpful for chronic inflammatory pelvic disease and prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate. And also for upper rep respiratory disease, and that's because of the same reason we're pulling blood away from the lungs and bringing it down towards the pelvis, okay? So that's the hot sits bath. Now with the heat, you can do that as well with your legs in, okay? So that might be easier if you've got a tub, you can sit in the tub, you can have your legs in up to your navel in water and, and good. So with the cold, yes, you have a question? So it's different from a bath because because you're not immersing your whole body. You're you're focusing on trying to keep the pelvis with more heat. So that draws blood there. You can think of your body as not having quite enough blood. You need blood all over your body, but it's not it can't be every or where at once. You just we don't have enough. And that's the way we're designed. So I'm not gonna say we don't have enough, but when you eat, when you rest, your body keeps the blood close to the core, close to your organs. When you're active, when you're when you're exercising, the blood goes out to your extremities, to your muscles, so that you you've got the, the right nutrients to do those sort of activities. When you get some area that's getting too much blood, for example, you're you're gonna have a headache and you feel like your head's gonna explode because there's so much pressure there, or you've got this sinus pressure, um, if you can pull the blood away from there and put it somewhere else, you'll relieve the congestion. So that's what we're looking to do. We're kind of moving the blood where it needs to be or away from where we don't want it, all right? So for the cold sits bath, you need to not put your feet in, okay? Your feet need to be outside. You don't want to chill your feet, and that's true of most everything with hydrotherapy. Don't get your feet cold, all right? Um, with the cold sits bath, this is the list of things that it can help with. Subinvolution of the uterus, bladder, and colon. Okay, so that helps to, to shrink the size of the uterus, let's say after a baby. Or sometimes there, there can be prolapse where, where you're actually having organs that are, are falling through the pelvic floor and that cold sits bath helps to tone the smooth muscle and kind of get it back where it should be. All right, Me metrorachia, that is, that is blood between menstrual cycles. This is for women only. Now, that you know, can be concerning. You, you, what, what you're doing while sitting in the ice sits bath, the cold water sits bath, is you're contracting those blood vessels to stop the bleeding, right? We don't, there, there shouldn't be bleeding between menstrual cycles. All right, now, it also helps with atonic constipation. Atonic constipation means you're eating fiber, you're, you're eating all the, the right foods, you're not eating too much cheese, you, you're getting enough water, but your, your intestines just do not have enough strength, they're, they're, they don't have enough tone. So if you use a cold sits bath, it helps tonify your, your, your organs there, especially your, your um, colon. And it helps you have normal bowel function. Like, I'm uh, repeating again, it has a general tonic effect. Could you just sit in the snow? And <laughs> <laughs> Could you sit in the snow? It reminds me of when I was a kid and you'd be out in the snow. I grew up in Chicago and, and you'd get cold if you sat in the snow too long. And it, yeah, we don't want you to get cold. After a while. We don't want you to necessarily get cold. Okay. But yeah, maybe if you were to bring the snow inside and pack it around you. Oh, there you go. There you go. But no, the, the water is actually helpful because you don't want it to be to the point of freezing. The temperature of the water um, should be about 
55 to 70 degrees. And when you're in the cold sits baths, it's a good idea to, to friction rub your hips and that, that just helps with the effect of the mm -hmm. circulation. Uh, maybe the Eskimos use different therapy or something. They may. <laughs> you know, we talk about using ice in other ways. Um, all right, so there's another way, and that's the contrast sits baths. And that's using both hot and cold. I, I missed your definition of general tonic. General yeah. tonic means, we're talking about smooth muscle in this case. So smooth muscle doesn't contract or re relax um, consciously. It does it on its own. It's an autonomic process. So if there's something, for some reason, that muscle is just flaccid, it's weak, it's not doing its job, and you use cold, it has this ability to just create tone in that muscle. This, this is anywhere. In general, yeah. In general. We're, we're talking about sitz baths in this case, yeah. so we're talking about the, the pelvic organs. Oh, oh okay. But, um, but I, I mean, cool in general does have a tonic effect, like splashing your face with cold water, um, it get, gets you energized, taking a quick cold shower wakes you up. So, so this general tonic reflexes just for anywhere. Yes, yeah. quick. Right. When, it, when the cold is quick. When the cold is long, long standing, it'll actually slow everything down. It'll slow your metabolism, it'll slow your blood flow. So you, it has a different effect, it has the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. All right. Contra sits baths, we're going to take a hot sits bath and a cold sits bath, and we're going to switch. We're going to start with heat, we're going to be in there for three minutes, and then we're going to go to the cold, and we're going to be there for 30 seconds. Three times. All right? Now that has the effect of improving your, oh, I'm sorry, increasing your pelvic circulation and the tone of your smooth muscle. It's going to relieve chronic pelvic inflammation and prostatitis again, so this is good for women and men. And it will also remedy the atonic, um, constipation, and fistula in anal, which is a fun, basically you're, you've got an infection, yeah, inside your, your gut, and you, you that's a very unpleasant uh, illness. All right, so we're going to go to, actually, I need to ask my ladies here, how are we doing? How are we doing? Are you feeling pretty comfortable still? Not too hot, not too cold? Yeah, I turn it off. Good, good. I need to wring this out, probably. How's your headache feeling? It always improves when I'm laying down. Oh, <laughs> not fair. Okay. She says it improves when it lays down. Her headache improves anyway, so. All right. All right, so. Let's go to one of my favorite hydrotherapy treatments. And that is something that you can do in your house very simply, because you're going to do it anyway. Contrast showers. Most of us like warm showers. There are a few exceptions. There are people who like cold showers. But most of us like hot showers. And the, for the thing about hot showers is it's going to open up those blood vessels, and it's going to slow down. Well, at first it'll speed your metabolism, but after uh, taking a long hot shower, everything slows down. So the nice thing to do at the end of a hot shower is take a very quick cold shower. You, you enjoy your hot shower and turn it all the way cold. Maybe you can rub the skin where the water's hitting, but essentially it's not to cold, make you cold at all, but it's to shock your, your circulatory system into contracting and your blood will, your circulation will improve. Okay? Now, if you're a person that has cold hands and cold feet, what that means is basically your blood doesn't want to get all the way out to your hands and your feet. Mm -hmm. And by doing this hot and cold alternating, which we, we just said do it once, do it at the end, that's helpful. But if you do it three times, so you go to hot and then switch back to cold and three times in a row, finishing with cold, you're going to notice your, your feet and hands will be warmer. And if someone sleeps in the bed with you, they may notice too. <laughs> all right? So they may be happy or unhappy about that. Um, so you would, do, you would do that for? You would do that to improve your circulation. Mm -hmm. Was that the, what you were leading to? No, I mean, I was thinking like hot flashes and things like that. Is that something hmm. you, that's hot, like a, With hot flashes, I would recommend. It almost felt, sounds like a hot flash situation, you know? Yeah, I guess you, with a hot flash, you might use cold like on your neck. Um, that would help to cool you down. I was just wondering if that shower was the. I don't know. 
I don't know. Maybe it, maybe it would. What it, what it will do is it improve your circulation. It will... Go ahead. What's your question? You know, the fins sit in their sauna. Right. And then they run out and jump in the ice cold right. lake. I would think that would send their blood pressure sky uh, high. Because it, it would clamp Yes and no. Remember how cold ice over the, the heart will actually slow down your heart rate? It improves the, the actual output, but it actually slows down your heart rate. So that can, if we're, if we're doing a hot therapy like this one, for example, I can be pretty comfortable her heart's okay. If, if you've got a lot of heat, you can increase your blood pressure. It's actually the hot part that might give you trouble with your heart. Jumping in the cold water, at first it's gonna be a shock, but quickly your, your heart rate will actually decrease. So um, it's a good thought, but really the, that's an excellent therapy. It's exactly what we're talking about. Get really hot, get cold quick, you're going to increase your, your circulation. You're going to you're going to improve your immune system. Um, you're going to I, increase. I did it, but it was in the summertime, so okay. The lake wasn't all that cold. Well, <laughs> you still got benefit, I'm sure. Yes. Why is there such a large difference in the amount of time that you apply cold versus the hot? Is it just because people can't stand a lot of cold? Or? It's unnecessary to do the cold as long because we're we're not trying to cool down the patient. We're just trying to shock the circulation. So there's, there's a difference when you have a long period of cold versus a short period of cold, and we're trying to take advantage of a short period uh, reaction. The reaction with short is you get a quick contraction of those blood vessels, but then the circulation actually improves. If you were to maintain the cold, then it would slow your circulation. It would slow the metabolism, so that we're trying to avoid that. We're trying to pump up the... So yeah, we're trying to get pump action. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, we're, it is, and that's exactly what it is too. We're opening up blood vessels and we're closing them down. Opening, closing them down, and it, it's a pump. We're getting that blood to circulate very efficiently. All right, guess what? It increases your metabolism as well when we do these contrast hot and cold showers. So this is gonna help with fatigue. It's gonna help with depression. It's gonna help with obesity. It's gonna help with diabetes, and it's gonna help with hypertension. Isn't that It'll nice? help your hair. It'll help your hair? It'll make it shiny. It'll make it shiny and it'll probably make it grow faster. Wait, we're hitting our hair too? <laughs> yeah, make sure it hits your head as well. The, the whole body. <laughs> okay. How does, it, how does it boost your immune system? How does it boost your immune system? It's improving your circulation. And if your circulation is improved, remember, where the blood goes, there's healing. So if you're getting blood everywhere well, efficiently, then you're strengthening your immune system. Then there's, there's more to that, but Simplistically speaking, that's the reason. Same thing with fatigue, depression, you're increasing the blood flow. Right, you're increasing blood flow to the brain, you're, you're giving yourself more energy, um, that's gonna give you a better outlook on life, hopefully, right? Okay, um, I think we're probably, we've probably been 20 minutes with these ladies, yeah? Okay, so we're going to go to the next phase here with you. We're gonna keep the, hot, uh, the cold compress there for a minute. What we wanna do, here we've had her with this hot water on her feet, and so her blood vessels are dilated, and everything's kind of relaxed and slowing down. So we're gonna turn that around. Right at the end here, we're gonna use cold water, I'm gonna pour it over, let me see if I can do this well. Can I help you? Please. All right, I'm, I'm gonna let you pour the, the water. I'm gonna lift up her feet here. Okay. All right. Do I pour the water in that the other dish? Pour it directly in the dish, but right over her feet. Over her feet? Yeah, over her feet. That's cold, isn't it? All right, that's good. All right, you can, yeah, you can go ahead. Can you put the, the tray over there? We're gonna move, yeah. move this. Thank you. She's just the fan of white. Okay. All right. So now, we're gonna let her feet down onto a towel, water out of the way, and we're gonna dry her feet off well. The thing about wet feet is it's gonna cool down the temperature more than we want. We just want them to get dry and regulate now. Now, I don't know if you see this on the camera, but I know you guys can see it. Her feet are bright pink. All right, she's getting good circulation there. All right, now, technically, the this, Therapy is done, but you get to rest. 
-hmm. And it's a good idea to rest for about 20 minutes after a treatment like this. You're comfortable. You can straighten out your legs if you like. All right. Here we are on this side. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Good. Okay. So the next step here is we want to make sure that the skin on your chest returns to its normal temperature and the skin on your back returns to its normal temperature. If you're doing this treatment at home, what you would want to do is have somebody help you. They take a cold washcloth <coughs> and uh, like ice water, just like what we had before, and they would, over the skin, rub your back to cool down the temperature of your back, and it's actually going to increase the blood flow. There's, there's a great reaction with the friction with the cold. We're not going to be able to do that today. What we're going to do today is we're going to take the ice pack, we're going to flip it onto your back, we're going to put the heat on your chest until the temperature normalizes. It takes about, what, five minutes, probably less. All right, so let me help you get that out. All right, go ahead and lay back. Good. We'll just lay this across your chest and let that warm up, okay? Now, we're gonna talk about a couple other treatments that can be done with hydrotherapy. This one was for bronchitis and for pneumonia and for <coughs> asthma in this case. Um, we're going to talk about sore throat. If you have a sore throat, there's a very simple way of helping a sore throat. That's, once again, taking one of these cold compresses, you wring out the water, and lying down in bed preferably so you don't have to hold it, you lay that cold compress across your throat. Don't cover it up with anything, just let it be there. Make sure that you've maybe got another towel to soak up whatever water may drip. What happens is your body is going to send blood to where that cold is to heat it up, and it's going to heat up that towel. And while it's doing that, you're getting, first you're getting the blood flow to go there, new blood flow. Then you're gonna get the improvement of the white blood cells that are coming there to fight off whatever you've got that's making your sore throat. It works really well, it works really fast. I love that, that treatment. My wife introduced me to that one though, it works well. We're gonna talk about the flu and fever. Ew. Lots of times people think you get a fever, get rid of it right away. Take an aspirin, take a Tylenol, whatever the case. That is not appropriate most of the time. Most of the time, the fever is there to help increase your temperature so that your white blood cells work better, so that your body has an advantage over whatever it is that it's fighting, whether it be a virus or whether it be bacteria. So, fevers are good. Now, that's right, your fever will kill off those bugs, whatever they might be. So the nice thing to do with a fever, or if you, if you have a fever, cover up, work with it, sweat, let your body get, just sweat out whatever it is that it's fighting, and the fever will break itself. There are exceptions where your temperature can go too high. Is that your question? We're in a holistic atmosphere here. Okay? Yes. Yes. So, I just wanted to tell you about what my parents used to do when I had a fever. Okay. What they used to do is they used to warm up some ginger, mm -hmm. root, ginger root, and they would slice it up and they would uh, put some, I, I don't know what kind of an ointment they had, but then they would rub your forehead and rub your maybe upper body or something like that, and then you put on tons and tons of blankets and you sweat. Right. Now what's what's the ginger doing? Do you know? I'm not sure. Ginger has, does anybody, can anybody answer that question? I know ginger has some, some good properties to it, yes. Nausea, does it affect the, uh, any tendency toward nausea? Well that might be why they do what it. What is that again? I didn't hear it. Is it, it's, uh, it has an effect on nausea, nausea mm. prevention. Nausea. Yeah, ginger. And it's on the stomach. That's the only thing I know for sure. Yeah, that's right. But, but when you say nausea, are you talking about opening up pores or? No, nausea, like you feel like you're going to vomit. Oh, oh, oh okay. Like okay. your upset stomach. Yeah. Yeah. And that may be part of it, but uh, we have another assist, uh, suggestion here that it helps with inflammation. So um, I don't know the exact reasons for, for using it. I know it's helpful for. Um, I had some ginger tea when my throat was bad 
people have heard it on the last video, I wasn't having the same voice I have now, and that was very helpful for that. Um, another topic. I'm, I'm not prepared for no, that one. Really <laughs> so, um, sweating out the, the fever is really helpful. You can get to a point where the fever gets too high, and it's very rare, it's only for people with very weak immune systems, and then you can create brain damage. But you'll go into a seizure. And what was this? If your fever goes too high. Oh, oh. So, if you have somebody who their fever is going too high, this is not a likely scenario. You'd want to put cold in their armpits, you could put cold on their head to keep their head cool because that's the, what we're concerned about is their brain getting fried, essentially. Mm -hmm. So you want to cool down their, their, the blood vessels over their head now, decrease the circulation of the brain. Um, but when we talk about flu and fever, I'm going to talk about a hydrotherapeutic treatment for helping with that, and that's enemas. That's not a, it's not a fun therapy, but enemas, we're talking about water enemas, will quickly rehydrate someone. When you've got a fever, you're, you're losing water quickly with all the sweating. Mm -hmm. You need to stay hydrated. So it'll quickly rehydrate you. It can take down the fever as well, if the body's ready for that. And you'll eliminate extra toxins that you may be, just maybe extra effort that your body's having to go through um, that it doesn't need to when it's trying to fight off a virus. Um, you think your skin temperature is back to deep? All right, let's get let's get, take this off of you. You can let me get that ice pack out from underneath you, and you can just rest too. All right. Now, um, any questions about enemas? Yes. I have heard some people say uh, that when they get a case of food poisoning. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they just can't eat for some period of time and they can become dehydrated. Right. And could this water enema rehydrate. Could be used to rehydrate in, Absolutely. in lieu of a, a, an IV? Exactly. Yeah. If you, your colon, what it, one of the major functions is to retain water. So mm -hmm. it, will, it will absorb water very quickly. So that it, that's why an enema is very helpful. So yes, exactly. A person okay. dehydrated, and M is a great way to rehydrate. Um, when you're preparing for a colonoscopy, you do something called fleet, which I think is a saline water. So is it better not to have salt in it, or? Yeah, because the, the saline solution is not, the idea is not to rehydrate you, right? The idea is just to clean you out. So they, they use mineral oil too. You, you could do that, and it'll clean you out, and that's another benefit but you're not getting the hydration benefit. So. Yeah, water follows salt. Right, water so follows good. salt. So it'll help pull water out with it. Uh -huh. um, so let's talk about asthma. We, we just did this treatment, hot and cold on the chest for, um, for helping with the lung function, helping with the asthma potentially. Um, people who have asthma and they're having an attack, an acute attack, 94% of people having an attack, if they take water and they just drink and drink and drink and drink, their attack will go away. 94% of the time. That's better than an inhaler. All right, so, um, so you know. You know anybody with asthma, if you happen to suffer with asthma, profuse amounts of water during an attack will most likely stop the attack. Hot or cold water? <laughs> cool water. <laughs> Okay, and that's, that's a good segue. We need to talk about water. We've been talking about how you use water on the outside mostly. We talked about enemas, which is getting to the inside. But I want to talk about very quickly, this is to close up, drinking water, getting enough water in your system. I'm going to be very simple. I like to be simple. I like things easy to remember. If you drink enough water, your urine has no color. It is not yellow, it is clear, okay? So if you see that you have yellow urine, it's time to drink more water. Now in the morning, you may have darker colored urine because you've been exhaling and inhaling, losing water through your, your respiration. But you drink water and sometimes throughout the day, it should be clear, okay? There's so many benefits to that. You, we're 75% water. We need water to function properly, so you need to be hydrated properly, and 
If you just do the simple trick of looking in the toilet after you use the bathroom, you'll know if you're hydrated or not. Yes? Can you take a moment and explain some of the um, disadvantages or some of the uh, effects of, that happen to people when they're dehydrated? The why behind being proper hydration, if, if folks aren't sure. properly hydrated, what can they expect? Oh, uh, you can ex expect fogginess in your, in your ability to, to concentrate and ability to think. You can expect more pain anywhere in your body. You can expect cramps. Mm -hmm. People who have cramps, for example, at night, maybe they're dehydrated. The mineral imbalance will, will create a contraction of the muscles involuntarily. Um, what else? Um, you're not going to have enough saliva for digestion. You're not going to have enough stomach acid to digest your food when you. So sometimes people think, I'm. They they eat and then they have the acid reflux and they think it's because they did not have enough. Or the, I'm sorry, that they have too much acid. So they'll take in something to buffer the acid. Well, typically what's really happening is they don't have enough water to create the acid to digest the food properly. That's another. Good. I'm glad you asked that question because there is a right way of drinking water. There's a right time and then there's a wrong time. The right time is between your meals. The wrong time is with your meals. You don't want to dilute your stomach acids when you're taking in food. So you should have already been hydrated before you've eaten. So what you, you need to drink your water, stop drinking water about 20 minutes before you're going to eat. And then wait about an hour after you finish eating and start drinking water again. Okay, and you'll, you'll, you'll protect yourself from having digestive issues. Yeah. I have a problem with that because okay. I have to take so many vitamins. With your meal? With meal. Yeah. Well, with your meal is a great time to have your herbal tea or your fruit juice. So herbal or tea is okay? Herbal tea is fine. Tea leaf tea is not fine. So anything with caffeine I want you to avoid, but herbal tea... You, small amounts of liquid with your food helps you get it down, helps you digest maybe a little bit better. But um, that's the time for your flavored drinks. When you have a flavored drink in between your meals, your stomach doesn't know the difference. Your digestive tract thinks, I'm digesting a meal. Pumps up the, the blood flow to your, your, your digestive tract. And you, you heard me talk about this with the nutrition. I don't want people eating between meals because they don't give their, their digestive tract a chance to relax, to rest. You, your, your organs need rest just like your muscles do. They don't need to be eating every six hours or processing food, I'm sorry, every six meals, every two hours. That's too much. It may seem right because it may help you lose weight or for, for whatever reason that they're telling you to do it. It may function for, for that, but it's not functioning for keeping your digestive system healthy. It's exhausting your digestive system. Yes. Yeah. So are you saying that three meals a day is the right? Yes. Three meals a day is the best way to eat. Now, I know we're going off topic here, but breakfast is the most important meal, lunch after that in terms of size and quality, and then dinner is the least important meal, and if you're not very physically active, you could leave it off. So that's, that's perfectly fine and healthy. Um, anyway, light, uh, the, the dinner meal should be the lightest and it should be easy to digest. And your water should be in between because water does not start your digestive system. It's the only substance that won't start your digestive system working and it needs to be cool but not icy. You get icy water and that's going to freeze your stomach and it has to stop everything that's going on until it heats up your, your contents enough to let that water pass through. Hot water passes through really quick. You probably notice that with tea. You probably notice that if you drink hot water, you're ready to use the bathroom very quickly. Well, cool water is, is easy to palate. It's, that's probably the best way. Not ice water, cool water. All right? Yes. So why would uh, warm water or hot water make you feel good? Drinking it? Yeah, right here. Drinking, it it's, it's, has a calming effect. It's relaxing, like we talked about. Heat can relax, mm -hmm. helps to open up blood vessels. So drinking hot water could be good for that in terms of if you're having like a cramp in your stomach, for example. If you've mm -hmm. you got like a tight stomach, you're nervous or whatever, drinking hot water might help you with that. Um, drinking hot water will also help bring 
heat to the, let's say your throat, you're having a sore throat, it can help loosen up the mucus, it can help increase blood flow, which will help increase the white blood cells to the area that's being infected, and that'll help with the healing. So, so, so along the lines of some of the information on the front, where you, for instance, where you alternated hot and cold, cold, hot and cold yeah. if you were to drink some warm or hot water, yeah. and then uh, some period of time after that, drink some cool water, and just do and just alternated that. Yeah. Would, would that have any kind of? I would. I would think it would have. I mean, I love that question because you're actually putting principles into action and coming up with with different mm -hmm. thoughts. And this this is what I want. I want you to know, heat does something, cold does something. If I do things this way, I could potentially be doing this or that and bringing blood. The once it gets to the stomach, it's gonna heat up the the cold. Okay. So you, anything between your mouth and your stomach might get the effect of the cold. Mm -hmm. So let's say maybe you're, you're having esophageal spasms mm -hmm. and you're, you, you do that hot and cold water. Potentially, that could be helpful. Or you've got that, that diagram there and it shows how if you've got esophageal issues, there's an actual area over the skin of your, your chest where you could do hot or cold, depending on what you need in that area. Mm -hmm. So the skin that overlies, typically the skin that overlies the organ will have the same effect as if you used water internally or heat or cold internally. So you're, you're, it's a great idea. You can, you can do it from the outside too mm -hmm. with the reflex um, reaction. I was thinking more just for the, the sake of the, the GI system and not something else around it. Well, like I said, with the cold, it's only going to affect until it gets to your stomach and then your stomach's going to warm it up before it can go any further. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe anything from your, like I said, your mouth down to your stomach. I've noticed in the morning, uh, before I eat or drink anything else, I down about 16 ounces of water. And uh, I've noticed that if it's, if it is more than, if it is lower in temperature than about tap water temperature, mm -hmm. then that amount of water will actually make me feel kind of nauseous. Not not to the point where I want to throw it up or anything, just like, uh, that's good. But if I warm it up some, for instance, uh, about like bath water at least, then I can down it and it's like it's not even there. Warm water is great. Your body doesn't have to do anything for it. It's just, it's already warm. It's already, that's why you have to use the bathroom so quickly because it goes through you so fast. By the way, water is a diuretic. So people who are having trouble with their kidneys and they need to be on a diuretic or they're having swelling, mm -hmm. you drink more water, it's going to dilute those whatever minerals are inside or, or what proteins are inside of the, the swelling. It's going to help to pull that through, take it out. So you don't necessarily need to be on a water pill. You can just drink more water. It sounds kind of backwards because you're putting more in what you're trying to get out, but it does work. Um, I know I changed subjects real quick. I'm sorry. Um, Hot water is, is really agreeable to your, your system. Lukewarm water makes you nauseous. I mean, that's it just it's common for a lot of people. Okay. Cool water is very palatable as well. So you, you kind of got to go to either, either way. There. So maybe drink the cool water just more slowly? You could do that. It, it, really, you're not going to have a problem with cool water. Yeah. You just don't want icy water. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, the icy water can be trouble. I, by the way, icy water, because you have to heat it up, it dehydrates you. So I have these patients and they think they're doing such a great job. They've got these big buckets of water and they're full of ice and just a little bit of water and they sip on it all day long. And they're dehydrating themselves. So it's kind of a waste of time. And I, I try and tell people that they like their ice. So there is a reason to why I'm saying these things the way I'm saying it. I want to give you one more hydrotherapy treatment because we're all ready to go home and get, get ready for bed. I'm ready for dinner. All ready for dinner. <laughs> all right. So when you, when you have anxiety, when you're irritated, when you're nervous, when you can't sleep, water has an ability, if it's neutral, just like when you, when you drink water, it's not going to start up your digestive system. Mm -hmm unless it's icy, um, on the outside, if you're to get in a bath that is just, just above your, your body's temperature, so 
let's say 98 degrees, 99, maybe a little too warm. You won't feel like it's much warmer than your body temperature, so lukewarm. No stimulating effect, no depressing effect. It's just almost no stimulation. And that will calm your nervous system greatly. So it will help you sleep. It'll help calm your nerves. They actually used it in treatment for people who were mentally unstable. So schizophrenia, um, uh, manic depressive, uh, bipolar, uh, calms the nerves and people are able to cope well. All right, so, or insomnia, so either one. How do you know when the temperature is right? You can take a temperature, you can no, measure not. the temperature, but essentially it's the same temperature as your body. So your body is going to be anywhere between 96 and 100 degrees. So you're going to be somewhere in there. So where you're not hot and you're not cold. Yeah, it should just feel like... What about a shower? Not the same. Not the same because it, there is a stimulating effect when the water hits you. Okay. So if you have a rain shower, it's probably better. A rain shower. It's a soft shower. It's, I think it's still going to have the, the same. So. It's, not, it's not as good as, as laying in the bath. And there's, you, you lay there for about 20 minutes, a very relaxing... Mm -hmm. Don't let it get cold, so you might need someone to help. You might turn on the hot just enough to, to bring that t temperature to neutral. And how long do you do that? About 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes. Well, okay. Like a normal bath. Right. All right, any other questions? I think my lovely assistants are sleeping. I did have one question. Yes. I don't keep this extra long. Just take another moment, if you would, and you've already said it, but uh, when do you drink your water? You drink your water between meals. So a great way to do it is first thing in the morning, you wake up and you drink a tall glass of hot water. And that's gonna get your digestive system ready to digest its food. Now, you're gonna wait probably about, uh, hot water's faster, so maybe about 10, 15 minutes before you eat your breakfast. Herbal tea would be fine too, same? No. Same? No? Herbal tea has got a flavor in it and it's gonna start your digestive system. It's not the same as water. Water will not stimulate anything if it's if we're doing the right thing. for lemon juice? Lemon juice is a good thing to use when you are um, trying to detox, for example, or maybe you're having a meal and you have water that you're drinking, you can squirt some lemon juice in there, and that has a little bit of acid and that might help a little bit. Um, so, Yes, with your meal, if you can have a little bit of water, but I don't want you to have lemon every time you have water because you're, you're started, starting your digestive tract and that's, I want it to rest. So that's why between your meals. So to start off, you said with a tall glass of hot, hot, hot water. water, then go to your breakfast, then you can drink water between, an hour after you've eaten breakfast, you start drinking your water and make sure your urine's getting clear throughout the day and you have your lunch, 20 minutes before you're going to eat lunch, you stop drinking your water. You shouldn't need to eat much. You'll have plenty of saliva, you'll have plenty of stomach acid, it may alleviate any gastric reflux that you might have experienced in the past, um, and, and so on. You might not want to drink a whole lot of water before you're going to go to bed, because you don't want to have to get up in the middle of the night. Now there is another therapy that I just thought of this for men who have that have prostate trouble that they have to get up various times during the night and I will talk about that to anybody who wants to know but I can't explain it well on camera I want people to not harm, harm themselves with this but I'll, I'll explain that for anybody who'd like to know after after the class okay um, any other questions thank you all for participating I hope you learned something I hope you got these concepts these these uh, these handouts that I gave you are by no means all-inclusive. There are so many hydrotherapy treatments, and uh, these, this is just the tip of the iceberg. But isn't it nice that there are things that are natural, no side effects, that you can do for all these, these really common illnesses that we have? So. Let's see, I've got two questions. Two questions. One is, one is uh, if you have dry eyes or dry mouth, does this water before meals assist in anything? Sure, or? sure. If you're well hydrated, where does your saliva come from? It comes from the water that you, you take in. That's, that's part of it. Okay. Same thing with your, your tear ducts. They have to get their water from somewhere. If you're well hydrated, you'll have better, better hydration for your tears and for your, your saliva. Okay. And, and second yes. question is, 
John Kellogg. Can you give me a reference for his books? John Harvey, Harvey Kellogg is his name. Yeah. Um, Rational Hydrotherapy is the name of his books. And they're two volumes, and they're huge. They're like encyclopedias. And they use terminology that is not used anymore, so it may be a little difficult to wade through it, but it's an excellent resource. That's uh, Rational Hydrotherapy. Hydrotherapy. There must be other hydrotherapy books. There are many hydrotherapy books. Hydrotherapy is still kind of big in Russia. It's still <coughs> big in some of the Scandinavian countries. There are women who give birth in cold ocean water, and that's a hydrother hydrotherapy, you could say, treatment, um, benefiting the immune system of the mother and the baby. Um, so hydrotherapy is huge. Uh, it's just kind of, like I said, it's kind of lost its, its popularity since the invent of um, antibiotics. Sorry. I have a question. Okay, one more question. Uh, I'm colorblind, and I s but I can see that there are different colors on this chart. Yes, the, there are, should be lines about. with the name that go right to the the. the so the color is just to an indication of another organ. Yes, it's okay. to try and separate because things overlap. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Yeah. I hope you guys have a wonderful night.